Okay, folks, just so, so we don't have any confusion for those of us who are joining us, uh, if you're here for the regular session, we actually are uh, wrapping up a special session that we had earlier. So just if you're confused, uh, that, that's why. Uh, we're in the middle of a other meeting. So uh, the closed session was adjourned at 6.56 uh, p.m., and no official action or vote was conducted during the closed session. Uh, that brings us to item G1, conduct possible follow-up questioning of applicants and consider resolution number 2024-46, appointing members to the 2024 Comprehensive Plan Update Committee. Um, so just so the council members are aware, we have, in terms of the resolution, the, this would include both the uh, appointment of the voting members of the committee, the four voting members of the committee, the three alternate members in order, of their alternate position and then in addition the resolution has a um a space for a council member to be named as the c uh, committee liaison and, and it will also the three um pnc members okay and the three pnc members who are who are already uh, specified in the um in and the i have amendment. those three pnc members in positions five six and seven okay great thank you And so unless a council member has additional questions for the applicant, um, I would uh, entertain a, a motion on the uh, resolution. Okay, I'll make a motion to appoint members um, for resolution number 2024-46. Um, Jeff Butler, position one. Tom Eustace, position two. Lynn Singleton, position three. Joseph Paul, position four. Nestor Menya, position five. Eric Ano, position six. David Locke, position seven. Alternate number one, Gregory Nash. Alternate number two, Ryan Trosted. Alternate number three, Steve Gill. And the liaison is Drew Walson. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The resolution passes unanimously. So uh, that is it for our special session. So we're going to go ahead and adjourn the special session and uh, wait two minutes to start the regular session.
Okay, folks, uh, I want to welcome you to uh, this regular session of the Jersey Village City Council for Monday, June 17th, 2024. The time is now 7.02 p.m. Uh, Madam Secretary, do we have a quorum of council present? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, for invocation and pledge of allegiance, it's Sherry Shepard, council member, place two. If you'll please bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your many blessings and for the opportunity to serve the people of our city. Help us to act with character and conviction. Help us listen with understanding and goodwill. Help us to speak with charity and restraint. Give us a spirit of service. Thank you for your love and your mercy. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Thank you very much. The next, uh, we don't have any presentations tonight, so we'll go right to citizen comments. Citizens who have signed a card and wish to speak to the City Council will be heard at this time. In compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, unless the subject matter of the comment is on the agenda, the City staff and City Council members are prevented from discussing the subject and may respond only with statements of factual information or existing policy. Citizens are limited to five minutes for their comments to the City Council. Um, so the only comment card I have is from Kimberly A. Now. My name is Kimberly Annell, and I live at 15601 Singapore Lane. As my 33rd installment, Jersey Village remained in the 20th century since it actually didn't end until December 31st, 2000. But the residents leapt into the new year of 2000 with friends nearby, including in-laws popping over as witnessed on Everybody Loves Raymond, though that could lead to visits to the ER and from Law and Order. These shows were so popular that we could not survive her without a VCR and VHS tapes. City Manager Del Brown reported no serious incidents with Y2K and all computers were working fine. A special session of the proposed purchase of the Jersey Meadow Golf Course included citizens' comments favoring the purchase, including the additional nine holes for flood water retention. Discussions to interconnect with the City of Houston's water supply began and to possibly contract for 40 years instead of using groundwater and a, and a warning as the city would need to ration water much earlier in the year. A developer proposed a gated residential area north of the golf course along Jones with private roads, though they must meet all city code re regulations and requirements. City Council member Charlie Wilson commented on the adoption of reasonable rules and procedures for conducting council meetings, such as explaining the processes in an informational booklet for attending residents. A homeowner on Parkway Place said, the no left turn situa situation from Village Green onto Jones was unsafe, while a homeowner on St. Helier stated his concerns with the increase of squirrels in Jersey Village. A former council member thanked the public works and fire departments for their help during a house fire. Representatives of a home development community company presented to the Planning and Zoning Committee and council discussion for 65 acres of homes on 76 acres, including storm water detention, access to the property northwards, and setback lines from seven and a half feet to five feet. City Council would need to approve the subdivision plat and smaller setback lines of garden homes, including the placement of windows on the sides of the homes. Authorization for bids to have car video systems installed in police vehicles 
was unanimously approved, as well as a request for pricing to implement computerized traffic citations for the police and municipal court. Mayor Schneider's comments included that Jersey Village did not have its own zip code, and Councilmember Rusty Priest drafted a letter to the United States Postal Service requesting they create one for the city. The mayor also advised of a letter from Harris County that they had no intent to change the lights on Jones and Village Green. Further, council emphasized to make sure that the sales tax be coded to the city for invoices such as cell phone bills and bottled water to avoid Houston inadvertently receiving the revenue. A motion was unanimous for the city to operate and manage the golf course with authorization to the city manager to begin hiring personnel and the contract for food concession services was awarded to lunch at Sam's. Quite a few provisions were included in the offer letter to buy the golf course that was begun in the 1950s. Council member Wilson commented on the need to make sure that the use of the email system does not violate the Open Meetings Act. Further to this topic, to better understand the current definitions of and examples of the Texas Open Meetings Act, documents can easily be found on official websites such as tml.org and texasattorneygeneral.gov, which has a PDF of the 2024 version of the handbook so as to avoid any misinformation and miscommunication of what is and is not legal regarding jurisdictional matters. Just as hard as change can be, remembering to write 2-0 instead of 1-9 on checks and paperwork was pretty difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Okay, that brings us to the city manager's report. Uh, Austin, please. Mayor, Mayor Gowser, the report's in front of you. If you have any questions, happy to answer those. Any questions from council for the city manager on his report? Seeing none. Okay, we will oh, just go ahead. Just clarify and reminder: the uh, work budget, budget workshop is uh, July twelfth. Yes, sir. And we'll have plenty of time to review that. I'll have it out uh, no later than June thirtieth. Okay. All right. We will move on to the consent agenda. Does any council member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda for consideration on the regular agenda? I'd like to remove F6, please. F6 will be considered in the regular agenda. F6. Does any other council member want to remove an item? I wanted to move seven, please. Removing F7, okay. If there are no other items for removal, I would entertain a motion uh, regarding the uh, consent agenda as modified. I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda with F6 and F7, uh, F7 items removed. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? Uh, the consent agenda as modified is unanimously approved. Uh, so we will start off uh, with item F6. Uh, consider resolution number 2024-49 authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with PEA Group for Ecuador pedestrian bridge design, construction documents, bidding, and construction phase services. Robert Basford, Assistant City Manager. Good evening, Mayor Council. This, this item is to authorize the city manager to enter into an agreement with PEA Group for the design, construction documents, and bidding and construction phase services for the Ecuador pedestrian bridge to replace the existing pedestrian bridge over the bayou. Uh, the pedestrian bridge was an approved project of the 2023 bond election, and this new de design will revitalize a heavily tra traveled bridge by Jersey Village residents, accessing parks local schools, and the local schools. The total cost for this design project is expected to be $50,000, which includes surveying, as-built drawings, bridge planning, layout, and construction drawings, wetland specialists, Texas agricultural barriers, project registration, construction phase services, and bidding assistance. 
If approved, staff will begin conceptual meetings to formulate a plan establishing an updated timeline and gathering lead times to strategically schedule the bridge construction to minimize usage impact. And our recommendation is to approve resolution 2024-49. Great. Thank you. Discussion amongst council on this item. Um, one, just to make sure this is a pedestrian bridge. And uh, s second, uh, <clears throat> do we know have a cost impact of, of what it may cost, or does that come out during the design phase? We have uh, 500,000 earmarked for this bridge. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? Uh, one quick question. Do we know, do, do they, number one, does the flood control district need to approve the design? And if so, is that part of this uh, contract? Yes and yes. Perfect. Okay. And I assume that they've got experience in dealing with the flood control district on such matters. Okay, good. Even better. That's, I know that's been a concern. Any other questions or discussion from council? If not, I would entertain a motion at this time. I move that we approve resolution 2024-49. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? Uh, the resolution passes unanimously, which brings us to uh, item F7, discuss and take appropriate action concerning the progress being made by the owners of the property located at 15830 Northwest Freeway, Jersey Village, Texas, to correct the substandard structure at this location. Uh, Maisha Johnson, Community Development uh, Manager. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, on January 22nd, 2024, uh, Council declared the structure at 15830 Northwest Freeway substandard and have since been um, getting status updates as each Council, um, council meeting. Uh, currently, we do believe that they are still within um, compliance as they have been completing the work on time. And actually, as an update to this, today I drove past at around 2.30 and that tree that they mentioned that was impeding the progress is down. Okay, great. Any questions or discussion from council on this item? I just feel the need to say I don't like it. It looks horrible. I hate it. I want it gone. And I know I can't do anything about it, but I just want to make sure everybody knows how I feel about it. They've filed for permits, or have they not? Yes. Okay. They mentioned that the only thing stopping their progress um, was that the storms happened. So they got the, the secondary structure down, um, demolished, then they had to get the tree down, and now they'll actually start the internal work and external work. In July. And just so that we have kind of a sense of what to expect next, what, what, are, what are kind of the, the, next, um, the next steps that they need to take in order to pursue the project further? Well, they'll keep, um, we'll keep putting this on the council agendas as to make sure that they are completing work within timely progress. So every council meeting, we should be seeing some sort of progress uh, according to their reports. Okay, so, so um, what sort of work are they currently? I, I know we've discussed what they have completed. Do we know what, what it is that they need to do next? So after this, they'll actually start the internal. Um, so everything's demolished. The secondary structure is demolished. The tree is demolished. So they'll actually start the cosmetic work inside. Okay, okay. All right, great. Any other questions from council? No? Okay, and I don't know that we need to, do we need to take an a any action on this particular item? I don't believe so. It's listed as an action item, so. One, one other question. Have they given any indication of when they may start doing something on the other side of Senate Avenue on the property they own? Um, so we've actually gotten um, questions about that property, and so I reached out to um, Donnie and asked about what they were going to do on that property, and he says that they do have plans um, to complete, let me pull it up one more time, what exactly the structure. Um, 
They have the intention to build a large new format convenience store and, for, and fueling station on that site. Now, that has no permits. They have not turned anything, but that is their intentions. I didn't think that was zoned for that. I believe it is. Well, for this, uh, yeah, we can't really talk about that property anymore. I think that's part of it. But just so the council can understand, what, what you need to look for on this particular property is as they do development, at some point they're going to satisfy what the order was that you, that you made. And so when they've reached that point, we'll have to have this as an, an additional action item just to, that you're going to take some kind of action to say it's resolved, the order's been fulfilled. Okay. We're not yet there, correct? Yeah, I mean, if I, I, obviously city staff will present that to you. But that's, that's the next step that you'll have to take besides approving these updates. Got it. Thanks to both of you for that information. Okay, so unless there's any further discussion, I uh, don't think there's any action we need to take at this time. So if everyone's okay, we will move on to the regular agenda. That brings us to item G1, uh, conduct a public hearing for the purpose of giving the public the opportunity to give testimony and to present written evidence concerning the request of Apex Heritage Properties, LLC, to amend the City of Jersey Village's 2020 comprehensive plan at Chapter 4 concerning the City's thoroughfare plan. I just got my name on it. One moment. Okay. And I guess just to give some context, does it make sense to go ahead and, before we begin the public hearing, to read the, because the, this is just a generic public hearing script. So uh, I'm just going to quickly read, kind of give everybody some background on this. Um, so um, Apex Heritage Properties, LLC, has filed an application requesting amendments to the city's currently adopted master thoroughfare plan, which is included in and made part of the city's comprehensive plan at Chapter 4. In its application, Apex seeks to remove proposed road segments from the thoroughfare, thoroughfare plan, the segments to be removed are in close proximity to the property they wish to develop, which is a 16.0194 acre tract located between Fairview Street and Wright Road, west of the intersection of Wright Road and Charles Road. A map of the area is included in the application that identifies the proposed road segments to be removed. Since the city's thoroughfare plan is incorporated into the city's comprehensive plan, in order to make the, an amendment to the thoroughfare plan, the city's comprehensive plan must be amended. Local Government Code Section 213.003 uh, provides for amending a city's comprehensive plan. Section 213.003 states, A, a comprehensive plan may be adopted or amended by ordinance following, one, a hearing at which the public is given an opportunity to give testimony and present written evidence, and two, review by the municipality's planning commission or department if one exists. Uh, B, a municipality may establish in its charter or by ordinance procedures for adopting and amending a comprehensive plan. In satisfying Section 213.003A2, the Planning and Zoning Commission met on June 4, 2024 and conducted a review of the Apex Heritage Property LLC's request to amend the City of Jersey Village's 2020 Comprehensive Plan at Chapter 4 concerning the City's Thoroughfare Plan. In completing the review, the Commission prepared a review report which was received officially by this Council during the consent agenda portion of this meeting, but is also included with, the item for, with this item for convenience uh, that's referring to the Council packet. Uh, this next step in the process is for City Council to conduct a public hearing as required by Local Government Code Section 213.003A1. Uh, so with all that being said, uh, I now call to order this public hearing at 7.20 p.m. for the purpose of giving the public an op the opportunity to give testimony and present written evidence concerning the request of ha Apex Heritage Properties, LLC, to amend the City of Jersey Village's 2020 comprehensive plan at Chapter 4 concerning the City's thoroughfare plan. Everyone desiring to speak should complete a public hearing comment card and present their, the card to the City Secretary. Each speaker will be given five minutes to present their evidence. Um, and my understanding is we do not have anyone that is currently signed up to speak on this item in the public hearing segment. Uh, so uh, unless there's anyone. Mayor, I think we do. We have, do you have one? Okay. Are you uh, Stephen Garza? Yes. Okay. I wasn't sure if you were speaking now or if you were speaking during the actual uh, portion where it would be presented. But go right ahead. Good evening, Council. My name is Stephen Garza. I'm a civil engineer with Bowman Consulting Group, representing Apex Heritage Group. Um, so we met with P&Z about two weeks ago um, to amend the thoroughfare plan. Um, the reason that that came up is that we're in due diligence for this 16-acre site. Um, and in our due diligence, it was discovered that there was, um, in the 2020 comprehensive plan, that there was a roadway that was designed to go from Fairview to Wright Road, basically connecting Charles westward. Um, that would require us to plot the property and 
and then when we plotted it, this would show up as a right-of-way dedication. Um, the problem with that dedication is that dedication would occur entirely in a 40-foot waterline easement. Um, we met with the city of Houston who owns that waterline easement. There's a 48-inch transmission line um, that is on that easement and is centered in our property in that 40 foot, so 20 foot on our side. So if we dedicated 30 foot, it would be, the roadway would be entirely on top of a 48 inch transmission line. City of Houston denied that request, which kind of um, led us to this point to present before PNZ and council. Um, it, you see in your packets, that's the roadway that's shown in pink um, on the exhibit that we presented. So um, first step for us to make this property developable is to remove that uh, roadway that showed up in the 2020 comprehensive plan that is falls entirely within the 40 foot water line easement um, that was already provided um, and we have plotting documents to show that that easement can't be paved over and met with the city on that um, second to that is there was three roadways um, that all dead ended in our into our property those were all avenues that shown up in the zoning maps so those were basically just mis mixed use avenues um, couldn't really find any information on how much right away would be dedicated um, second to that all of this would kind of be resolved during the plotting process so we started this process in order to know what we can develop develop plans to move forward and so this is kind of the first step for us um, so we, we're basically asking council to consider amending the plan and when we met with PNZ um, they they didn't really have direction for which way they should go or how to amend the plan I know the city is looking to amend the comprehensive plan um, in the coming year um, but as a developer, that kind of slows us down in the process. Like I said, we would have to plot the property regardless. So all of these roadways would show up in the plat. So um, we're looking to abandon those by comprehensive plan and not have to abandon those by plat, basically saving us some months in the timeline. As far as the developer, the developer is, we, we haven't got to zoning. The next step would be zoning. Okay, what is it zoned for? Um, we're currently in the ETJ. We've had several meetings with the city manager about what it would look like. Um, to be annexed into the property. There's no utilities that are currently serving the property. So we're basically just taking the next right step. And so we believe that the next right step would be to remove the pink roadway that shows up in the 2020 comprehensive plan, which would just be the thoroughfare plan, and then remove the at three avenues that all dead end into the property that are kind of to the northeast. So that would give 16 acres that are fully developable for our owner. So. And do I have time to answer questions or I don't know? Um, so steps. I think what we'll do is this is, since this is the public hearing portion, uh, I, I believe right after this we have the actual discussion on the item. I'm sure if council has questions, uh, then, then there will be an opportunity in the next portion to do that. Okay. Thank, so thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, and I do not have any other comment cards for this public hearing. Okay. Um, there being no one else desiring to speak, I now close this public hearing on the con uh, concerning the request of Apex Heritage Properties, LLC, to amend the City of Jersey Village's 2020 comprehensive plan at Chapter 4 concerning the city's thoroughfare plan at 7.25 p.m. That brings us to item G2, consider ordinance number 2024-17, amending the City of Jersey Village's 2020 comprehensive plan at Chapter 4 concerning the city's thoroughfare plan by removing certain road segments located between Fairview Street and Wright Road, west of the intersection of Wright Road and Charles Road, Misha Johnson, Community Development Manager. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, since you read the background information, I'll just say that during the meeting with PNZ, they did recommend to not approve the amendment um, along with staff. And the um, applicant is here to answer any questions as well. Okay. I, I noticed that the that the, there wasn't really much uh, information given on uh, planning and zoning's um, rationale, uh, but I, I was just about to say, I thought I saw Rick. Um, if if y'all are okay with it, I would like to actually hear from Rick Faircloth as the chairman of the PNZ Commission so we can get a, a little bit better sense of the discussion from the commission. And Rick, I apologize for putting you on the spot. That, that's, that's all right. I can, I've been known to wing it for the last 50, 60 years. Uh, yeah, the uh, PNZ met, and based on the information and in the, in the applicant uh, presented some of the same information. Uh, we felt we didn't have enough, we didn't have enough people or the right people on there to make this decision. And uh, I guess we punted it to the council. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we wanted to make sure 
that any action that's taken along that doesn't have any impact on our master plan of that area, which has been on the books for many, many years. And so that was the reason for us not taking any uh, action to recommend to go ahead and do it at that time. If we would have, then probably it would have been easier for the council to, to go ahead and take some action. But uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, if any of the discussion with the city manager and, and the, with, the, with the applicant uh, uh, clarifies that, but uh, that, was our, that was our position at that time. Okay, I totally understand. Um, so I, I guess, and I'm, uh, unless someone on council has a, a strong feeling on this one way or another, I kind of feel like Rick did, which was, I don't quite get what, what the, I mean, I get what's being asked more or less, but um, kind of, it may be easier for it to be laid out in terms of impact. Is this of really no impact or uh, is this something that would seriously hinder future development over there? I'll let Austin answer that policy part, but more maybe a different way to think about the procedure on this thing. So you have, and the reason why we have to go through this whole deal of, you know, layer and layers to get to this essentially removing one line is because you have subdivision regulations and then that's your platting. When someone submits like for any kind of development, any kind of changing a land structure, doing any kind of development, you need a plat. And platting, you're going to require right-of-way dedications, easement dedications, that kind of stuff. So you have in your platting requirements right-of-way dedication, which in this case how that even comes to be is through all the it's a thoroughfare plan it's attached to your comp plan which is why we have to take that long route this particular line which was presented to you in your which is understandable you were looking for an east to west connection so you required a dedication of right away over that area when it happened I, i'm not sure of that the engineers can answer that question but at some point whether it was when that thoroughfare plan was adopted or after that that this sewer line i think it's a sewer line was already there and there and it was apparently the city of houston saying we are not going to allow any kind of roadway to be over that thing so you have right now a requirement to have right-of-way dedication over an area where apparently the city of houston is saying we're not going to allow a road so it, that's the, that's what's being primarily being asked you have also three other roads on this that are a little more confusing because they're part of your zoning ordinance this property is in the etj so zoning wouldn't even apply at that point so it really what's being asked of you is this pink, like the, it, on the map up here, some page, I don't even know, 304 of your, of your packet, you'll see this pink line on a proposed plat, and that would be the one that's being asked to be removed. And so, but in order for that to happen, like the applicant said, is you have to amend your comprehensive plan by amending the thoroughfare plan and this particular requirement on the thoroughfare plan to remove it. That's, that's the procedure you're in now. Now, if you were to say, no, we're going to keep our comprehensive plan, we're not going to do that, there are other avenues that the, that the applicant can pursue. Now, if they've been talks, if they've been talks with the city about, about annexation, there's ways we can annex property under certain agreements, and we can deal with some of these issues at that point. It doesn't, and again, that's not a guarantee for them at this point because you're not considering that agreement, and that's going to be at the end of, in, of a negotiation and all that. But there are other ways to get that. But this would be the, the tier one way to go, is just to amend the thoroughfare plan to remove this, this requirement. Now, as your question, Mayor, was how does that affect you long term, that would be. So the long term policy implications of this would be that it would ultimately alter the, the plans that we've had in place since uh, 2010 or so. Um, specifically as it relates to the District D zoning in those streets and how those streets would interact potentially with this thoroughfare area. Um, the whole concept of the, the district dezoning um, was to, to was to get the, the mixed use development going. You know, if if there's a discussion around whether or not that zoning is is still relevant or something like that, that's the conversation that PNZ or council could have. But by doing this step here tonight, it feels like it's kind of a pushing that step forward without having a full conversation of all of the ramifications of of that. So while this is the first step in that box, I think the council needs to take that, take a first step with all of the next steps in mind and how that can all impact everything down the road. Um, if I may, I feel, I know you mean to come if nobody feels very strongly about it, but for me, this seems kind of like we're, like what he's saying is if we were to do this, 
We're jumping what we just named committee members to do, which is to um, 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 update the comprehensive plan, which this is a part of that, um, as well as P and Z. I just feel like that's, you know, we have those committees in place. We have the plan in place. Um, I think that needs to go through those committees before us just deciding, let's just cut something out. Well, I, I tend to agree with you, and I, and I think that, that uh, Mr. Garza brought up a good point, which is they're not due to produce a, an amended product until next year. Um, so if, if their development, if they're without an answer between now and next year, um, that doesn't seem to be very fair. Uh, I, I, I get what you're saying, which is ideally, yes, that would be the proper that would be the way you would want to go, but I think that's also why you have a process under state law that talks about going through your planning and zoning commission. Um, I, I think what we kind of need to get more down to the, the nitty-gritty on is how important is this, and also what the heck is a city of Houston sewer line doing in the middle of our ETJ? Uh, they got more than enough... Uh, uh, it connects their water plant that is also in our ETJ to the rest of their water system. It's a water line. Well, I under, Oh, it's a water line, not a sewer line. Okay, that's totally different because obviously that's how we get our water. So when I heard sewer line, I was like, it's, yeah, my fault. Sorry about no, that. No, 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 no. That's how I, I the crappy. Part. Okay. Okay. I, I, that, that totally makes sense now. Um, so I, I just, my thinking at least initially is if, if city of Houston has a water line there, which we're obviously going to be using for a long time. And if the city of Houston is not willing and has the right to say no to building of a road there, then what? I mean, it, it sounds like it's kind of already been more or less decided. And that is one of the things I think the Comprehensive Plan Committee should look at and consider um, when they do this. And, I, you know, however long ago when this thorough plan, thoroughfare plan was um, adopted originally, I don't know all the details that were discussed there, um, perhaps there still needs to be a connection between uh, Wright Road and Fairview. Um, that might not be the most logical alignment. Maybe it should go on the other side of the property or follow Charles Road all the way through. But I think that's something that that Planning and Zoning Commission and the Comprehensive Planning Commission should evaluate through that whole discussion on the thoroughfare plan. And I think if the council were to take a step here tonight, um, that could short circuit that discussion process that I think should probably happen. I agree with Austin on this. I think it's, I think for us to do anything is kind of presumptuous at this point. Well, I don't fully appreciate or fully understand what the potential impact could be at this point. So, you know, to make a decision with not having the full picture. Um, I agree. It's just a little too early to make a decision like this. I by no means want to slow down development and hinder development, but I also want to make sure that I fully appreciate what the impact to our city is or could be. So I guess what we would be – now I understand why, why planning and zoning sort of just said, nope. Um, yeah, I think, I, think, uh, I think we do need to have a better understanding of exactly what – because right now I don't. It's it's not even very clear what the result would be if we said yes, if we said no, if we did nothing, um, or, or to even understand if there's, you know, alternatives that would be acceptable that we haven't necessarily talked about tonight. So one option that I mean, if if you were to say no to this or just say take no action on it because it's too early, again, there's there's still a another option there's lots of other options but uh, depending on where the property lies there's uh, the applicant can ask for variance to your subdivision regulations which could fall this could fall under that if you know there's discussion with the city about annexation through a development agreement those types of agreements can account for this kind of thing and allow the city and the property owner to work out specifics related to platting and annexation and all that so that can be part of that agreement again none of those answer the question and can give a solid answer, but there are other avenues to pursue in addition to the, you know, changing the comprehensive plan. I, yeah, I, I don't know if anyone else has some comments, but I, I think at least having a, a more fully fleshed out understanding of 
what are the options, what are the impacts based on the various options, so that we can at least have a, a more uh, educated decision to make, because right now it feels very abstract. Uh, I like the idea of, of options, and through this process, we basically usurp all of them. I mean, I'd, I'd <clears throat> perhaps even pursue the avenue of taking no action on this this item so we don't uh <clears throat> you know negatively influence anything going forward but maybe that's not the best way to go um but i i think not approving it is in the best interest of of op a lot of these other options justin mentioned and just for procedure wise i mean the, the state law Laura included it in your in your packet. The steps to take for amending a comprehensive plan are, are pretty simple. Planning and Zoning Commission's got to hear it, and then you have to have a public hearing, and then you adopt the change by ordinance. That's why the, this item is an ordinance. If you take no action, I mean, I th you've still satisfied. If, if this comes back before you next meeting or the meeting after that, you've satisfied the public hearing requirement for it, and so we can still you're still open to agreeing to it an ordinance if you get more information, or if you don't take any action and we go down another route. So I mean, it's. You're following the procedure that's in state law, which is pretty general. So unless anyone else has anything else to add, I do think right now that's probably the best path to take is just no action at this point. You know, it's not a no. It's sort of a just we kind of need more information to be able to better understand what what all this uh, means in the long run. So uh, I assume that's the consensus on council. So that's the case. And we'll take no action on this, and we will move on down the agenda. Which brings us to item G3, consider resolution number 2024-50, uh, granting B and C Entertainment LLC uh, DBA Comedy Sports a variance from Section 65 of the City of Jersey Village Code of Ordinances to allow the sale of alcoholic beverages within 300 feet of a church. Lori Cootie, City Secretary. Yes, so, uh, Mayor, I've received an application from uh, B and C Entertainment uh, DBA Comedy Sports to uh, certify their location for an alcoholic beverage uh, business. That's part of my pro my part in it for the state application for the TABC. Uh, what happened when I received that, I checked into it and found out that the location is within 300 feet of Hope Church. And that is against our city ordinance, section 6-5. Um, and because they're located with 300 feet, I could not do the certification. But we did find out uh, through further investigation that under section 109.33 of the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Code that there is a um, variance process. And um, the applicant has asked that the council look into the variants of our code and allow the um, applicant allow me to do the certification and I'm not sure is the applicant here okay if you want to come forward and give some more information that'd be great Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, letting us come talk tonight. Uh, my name is Benji Cooksey. I'm with Comedy Sports and BNC Entertainment. Um, uh, we are a comedy theater, uh, improv comedy theater, uh, celebrating our 34th year here in Houston. Um, and um, I think at the basis of what we do, we're a family-friendly comedy theater. Um, if you've ever seen the show Whose Line Is It Anyway? It's very similar. Uh, we just do a, a competitive version of that. Um, we've been a, a longtime member of the community over here in West Houston. Uh, I'm personally from Spring Branch and have lived over here in Jersey Village uh, for a long time as well. My sister uh, developed a couple neighborhoods over here. Um, in terms of uh, what we're trying to do with the alcohol license is we just want to be able to provide beverages for our shows. We're not looking to uh, become a bar for the sake of just having a bar. Uh, it will not be a, um, that will not be the primary uh, income for our business. It will just be a part of what we do on uh, Fridays and Saturdays. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other specific questions about it, but uh, we really appreciate your consideration in this. Does council have any questions for the applicant? So, Mayor, I did want to just add that the um, in the application, the applicant did have Exhibit K, which is the lease for Hope Church, and I wanted to point that out. 
That's okay, right. Uh, we, um, I, I've actually spoken with Jordan Ward, um, the head pastor, and um, uh, they had signed on the their lease that they would approve anyone uh, to be able to come in and sell alcohol as well, or it would be okay with them, uh, rather. And um, not only that, we've actually partnered with uh, many churches here in Houston, and we have um, members of Hope Church, and I know some of the council's members of Hope Church, uh, and my, uh, who are both in comedy sports and members of Hope Church. Um, so I thought that was uh, actually pretty great in terms of what we're trying to put together over there. I think it's great that um, more businesses are coming in, and, and it's definitely nice to see you guys working together. It seems like a housekeeping issue um, to satisfy TABC and all parties are in agreement. Yeah, I'm pleased to see that you guys spoke with Hope Church um, about that. Real quick, just logistics-wise, does your entrance face north, or are you right next door to Hope? Because it looks like theirs faces south. We, we share a wall with them. We're, sh- we're facing the same direction, though. Okay. I believe it's north. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. It doesn't matter. I'm <laughs> not... I'm, by 300 feet, you know, as uh, to yeah, yeah. Except Miller Light style going through the wall. But yeah, exactly. Um, well, then I'll make an, a motion to approve resolution 2024 50, um, granting BNC Entertainment the variance. I'll second. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion from council? Very excited for it to open. Thank you. Uh, seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? Uh, the resolution passes unanimously. So <laughs> that brings us to item G4. Consider ordinance number 2024-18, amending the general fund and capital improvement budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2023 and ending September 30th, 2024 in the amount not to exceed $1 million by increasing line item 01129760, transfer to capital improvement fund, and decrease line item 10909751, transfer from general fund. Isabel Cato, finance director. Good evening. Uh, yes. Um, during last fiscal year 22-2023, City Council authorized a transfer, this transfer for $1 million. Unfortunately, uh, it was not executed because of um, I, of an oversight of my part. So uh, these funds are very important for uh, different completion of different projects, like the new playground structure for Carlos Fox Park, the ball fields at Clark Henry Park, and and other capital improvement funds. So we're kind, of, uh, kind uh, we're requesting if you could please approve this ordinance. So we're just reapproving something we we originally approved last fiscal year, and so we're just yeah. reapproving it. Okay. Any discussion amongst council on this item? Uh, I would entertain a motion at this time. I make a motion that we approve ordinance twenty twenty four dash eighteen. All second. We have a. I think we have a motion from Councilmember Shepard and a second from Mayor Pro Tem Mitchum. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? Uh, the ordinance passes unanimously. That brings us to item G5. Consider resolution number 2024-51, authorizing the use of hotel occupancy tax funds to refund the general fund revenue used for the purpose of financing a portion of the Jersey Meadow Convention Center slash Clubhouse Project. Austin Bleece, City Manager. Mayor and Councilors, as part of the Convention Center Clubhouse Project, this council has allocated money from the general fund to cover the costs of this project. Previously, council has discussed doing this as a loan, which would be repaid by the hotel occupancy tax fund. Hot funds are specifically designated under state law to promote tourism, support convention, and hotel industries. Um, so this resolution before us tonight would allow us to reimburse the general fund portions of those costs going forward. Typically, the hot fund generates about $100,000 in unallocated funds each year. As things exist today, uh, this would certainly not cover the full amount of that expenditure. However, if development occurs and new hotels are constructed, we would see more hot funds that would speed up the repayment of that. So the proposed resolution establishes that the hot fund complies with the statutory requirements uh, for the expenditures. It also outlines the parameters for the city manager or designee to follow in implementing the refund. The process involves budgeting the collection 
selected hot funds not allocated to other eligible activities as a transfer to the general fund. Additionally, if actual revenues exceed expenditures at the end of the fiscal year, the excess amount would be transferred to general fund following a budget amendment approved by the city council. So this resolution uh, underscores our dedication to looking at the financial resources that we have while, we, uh, while adhering to the regulatory re regulations that we have to follow as well. Um, by approving this resolution, the city council will enable the effective use of hot funds while promoting tourism and enhancing the local economy. Okay. Uh, discussion amongst council on this item. Glad we finally found a I know. way to use them. We've been waiting. Yeah, if you're, if you're ever having trouble falling asleep, read that section of the tax code. It's, it's, uh, it's Byzantine, to say the, the least. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2024-51. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All those against? Any abstentions? The resolution passes unanimously. Um, that brings us to item G6. Uh, consider resolution number 2024-52, awarding the bid and authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Pipe View America for the 2024 wastewater collection system cleaning and televising project. Robert Basford, assistant city manager. Good evening, Mayor. On June 6th, city staff received bid documents for the televising and cleaning of the sanitary sewer lines installed pre-1970s pre through the 2020s, which is essentially our entire wastewater collection system. Four responsive bids were received for the project uh, listed in the table below. Uh, the bids ranged from $493,000 all the way up to $727,000 with a range of calendar days for substantial completion time. The original engineer's estimate for this project was $904,000, which included a 25% contingency. The scope of work consists of cleaning and televising approximately 189,000 linear feet of sanitary sewer pipe, including 1,900 linear, linear feet of less than 6-inch pipe, 14,300 linear feet of 6-inch pipe, so on and so forth of different pipe sizes. <laughs> City staff and consulting engineering firm Quiddity Engineering worked together to ensure bidding was conducted in compliance with all applicable federal and state, state and local standards. Pipe View America submitted the lowest responsible bid for the project. Pipe View America is a credible company that comes with a recommendation from the consulting engineering firm Quiddity Engineering. Approximately 53% or 253000 of this total cost will be paid for from the bond funds approved in 2023, and the remainder will be paid from the Utility Fund Capital Improvement Fund. We currently have $187,000 remaining this year in the Utility Fund Sanitary Inspection Line item, and 250000 remaining in this year's Utility Fund Sanitary Rehab Line item that we can use for this project. With this project set to last 225 calendar days, we will budget the end-of-the-year balances to roll over with an additional $73,000 budgeted to the inspection line item to cover the cost of this project. This project should be completed in early 2025. The importance of this project is to identify the severity and scope of the repairs needed for our wastewater collection system and will at the same time provide some preventative maintenance by way of pipe cleaning. And our motion is to approve resolution number 2024-52. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, discussion amongst council on this item. A couple things, Robert. Uh, one, I think when we were talking about the bond, we had discussed that we're going to look at and prioritize and use the bond for cleaning and any repair of pipes through, I guess, 1980, 80, I think. So is that, does, is that part of the reason for the 50-50-ish split? In costs? Okay. Yes, step one in this process would be televising all of them to identify the severity and, and what type of uh, specific repair approach will be needed for each. And I think we experienced last year and the year before and yeah. all that. Anything can happen in 225 days. Do we have these prioritized, which ones were going first, or is that based on some other mechanism? Y yes, we have a plan in place. Fantastic. And it looks like we came $400,000 under budget in this project? Potential? Yes, essentially. Well then, oh. So it's, it's about 400000 under the original engineer's estimate, so. Oh, okay, okay. All right. 
anticipated. Do, do we have to know was was the uh, again sort of one of the things that always um, draws my attention when I look at something like this on bids is the the spread from the highest to the lowest. Um, was that primarily based on the completion time? Because it seems like the completion time runs roughly in line with the uh, with the cost. In other words, for seven hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars, there's a bid that gets gets it done in one hundred and sixty calendar days, and for four hundred and ninety-three thousand dollars, we get it done in two hundred and twenty-five calendar days. I didn't know if there was any other major uh, contributor to that. So our, our engineer is here, and she might be able to answer that for you, Mayor. Good afternoon, or good evening, Mayor and Council. I believe that's the, the in, in interpretation we have, that the lower the cost, the longer it is, which we felt was more uh, amenable to the city to have a lower cost and it take a little more time to make sure we got a good product for keeping your money in mind. And also considering it's not a huge difference in time in terms of the grand scale of the project, then that's a pretty significant savings for just take a little longer. Um, did Quiddity or have we found through other referrals from Pipeview, are they usually remaining on schedule? Um, I talked to another consulting engineer that recently used them uh, for the first time, and they said they had no issues with them staying on schedule. We are working with them currently on another project. They are, work, they are running a little behind schedule on that one, so we're hoping that we can keep them in line with this one when we get the phasing plan to keep them in track to make sure that we move forward quickly. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion from council? If not, I'm going to entertain a motion on this uh, item. I uh, make a motion to approve resolution 2024-52. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? Uh, the resolution passes unanimously. Uh, that brings us to item G7, consider ordinance 2024-19, amending the general fund and the capital improvement budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2023, and, in, and ending September 30th, 2024, in the amount not to exceed $529,883.13 by increasing line items 01, 12, 9760, transfer to capital improvement, uh, 1090 transfer from general fund and 1091 golf course convention center to cover the cost of the golf course building steel remediation change order uh, extending the contract completion date with brookstone lp to november 7th 2024 and authorizing the city manager to sign the necessary documents with brookstone lp to affect the change order and contract extension robert bassford assistant city manager Okay, on April 17th, uh, some unforeseen conditions involving the structural steel at Building A, which is the existing building of the clubhouse, uh, specifically rusted, rusted bolts and two columns near the pro shop area of the building were brought to our attention and work on the renovation was stopped to allow for additional testing. The project team began establishing a remediation scope that involved calling Meritech Engineering out to the site to assess the building and to provide a recommended remediation plan to reinforce the existing steel structure that would support the weight of the new materials being added. Meritech's initial visit established a material testing scope that could be used to set the remediation plan, which was scheduled and conducted in early May. After a brief delay due to the windstorm and some power outages, the material testing report was submitted to the design team and the remediation plan was finalized. Once finalized, the plan was reviewed by FGM Architects and submitted to Brookstone to finalize their construction pricing and an updated construction timeline. The reinforcement work will also involve some demolition and reinstallation of materials. And below is a summary of the cost outlined in the potential change order. The cost for this work is $529,000, and the delay has pushed substantial completion back to November 7th, 2024, primarily due to material availability and rework durations, and the time extension has been requested. A 10% contingency has been included to cover any potential changes in the fabrication set of drawings that are currently being produced. All right. Discussion amongst council on this. I mean, we essentially chose a remodel, right, <laughs> to save money. And unfortunately, sometimes when you get into stuff, you find that things are not as sound as you assumed they were, or you, there was no way to know this until everything was down. That's just no possible ways. Unfortunately, this is just one of the things that can happen. And it's not like we're going to leave it halfway done. 
or tear down and rebuild completely, I think also not a choice. Well, I mean, could be a choice, but. Now remind me again, Austin, was the, this was separate from the maximum guaranteed price agreement, correct? Or is that not right? The original, the GMP is, is both buildings together. Um, this amendment would take us well past that um, just because there were some allowances that were factored into the GMP for other items. Um, but this would be, uh, this would essentially increase the GMP. So I guess the, the question becomes, is this an exception from the guarantee, the maximum guaranteed price uh, because it's a pre-existing condition or what have we looked at the, the contract to ensure that this is something that they can ask us to come back and, and issue a change order for? I have not reviewed the contract for this. So it, I, I don't know the percentages we're talking about for a change, change order. So as long as it's within the 25%, that's what we'd be looking at, either dates or, or cost. Because this is unforeseen, I mean, it was not factored into any of the construction pieces of it, and that's why staff felt that this is an uh, something that we, nobody had investigated before. Um, so certainly to, to st from our staff point of view, um, we felt that this was kind of outside of that GMP. We can, also, we can certainly go back and look at that with the, the city attorney and everything if council would wish us to do so. Um, but because I think the building plan sets were made with a certain set of understanding and of the condition of that building, and now we've found that that condition is not as it was when those plan sets were made, that's why we're bringing it here tonight. I guess what I will, and again, I, obviously other council members are welcome to chime in on their thoughts on this. My, my concern would be that, I, I, and again, I, I, I have not gone back and looked at the original contract, but uh, I don't know that it's necessarily true, and it may be true, but I don't know that it's necessarily true that this is something that is undiscoverable, absent, getting this far into the project because they'd stripped that down a while back right the the they'd stripped down the the existing building for the most part i, th I want to say a month or more ago so this and this was found back in mid-april ish okay okay um and so because you couldn't really strip down to the to the steel um while the other building was in operation especially this part being in the the old clubhouse area, like where the pro shop was and everything, that made it a bit more difficult. I don't think it was, um, the architect certainly did not have a full grasp of every piece of the steel, and this is one of those things that you're just not going to see until you've got full unimpeded access to view all the steel. Um, to answer the, or to go to the city attorney's point about the 25% the threshold, we would be still, would still be under that 25% threshold. Um, that would be about a $2 million change order all in, um, a little bit more, um, based upon the project cost. So, okay. So the, so the contract does have the, that, that contingent amount, even if it is something that could have been foreseeable. So even be. in a construction contract, if you don't have, even if you don't have contingency, you're allowed to, and this is styled as a change order. You're allowed to do a change order up to 25% down or up, and that's, that includes cost and calendar time. And that, that's something you're allowed to do without having to worry about procurement issues. So, so in that realm, so I have not reviewed that term, but in that realm you're fine to, to order authorize a change order as long as it falls within that 25%. It wasn't so much that I was concerned about the, the, the procurement rules. I was more looking at what are our contractual rights as a city versus – uh, the w what's our responsibility versus what's the responsibility of the contractor? Yeah, but that I have not looked at. But I would assume that if they're doing this and it's and they're styling this thing unforeseen issues, and that's where you're getting the cost on that. That's I'm assuming that's what they're going to tell the city is that unforeseen issues. This happened to do it, and because they're telling you it's a change order, that that's where it's coming from. It, if they were coming back and this was going to do something like double the cost or go say it's a 45 percent increase. And they're still trying to push that through. That'd be extremely problematic. But now that if we're in with the twenty-five percent, then that should be an expected, you know, expected part of these kinds of deals. And sometimes you'll even have it the opposite, where you come in and you have a GMP set, and you're you're dropping way down because of an, an unforeseen thing, where we thought we had, you know, improper, you know, steel. But we have everything's fine, so we don't. It's not, you know, eight million dollars. It's only four now. Still, that would fall with outside that twenty-five percent change order. You have to do some stuff again. So it's it, it's either way. It's supposed to protect you. So your issue. 
that I would have would be even beyond those, whatever the contractual obligations would be, the change order status. And so if you're within 25 percent, then you're good. And, and they would have accounted for that in the, in the contract documents because they're not going to, they, they can't do that on there and they can't go beyond 25 percent and they should know that. But we're still talking about procurement rules, right? Procurement, but that's how they're going to get it. I mean, that's what the that's what hold the city back from entering to this kind of agreement. Is you have this, if this were engineering or something like that, we don't have to worry about procurement. But because it's a, it's a contract for construction services, including materials, I think and I think we did this as a uh, uh, G, uh, yeah, GMP project. Still, you got there's a certain procurement you got to go with that. That's where the twenty five percent hits, and so that's why I'm, that's why I keep talking about procurement because that, that's really the issue we're going to be dealing with. So I, I'm, I'm really, I mean, uh, it, it, I, it I am worried about the procurement rules, but my concern right now really is more about a, let's ignore for a moment that we are a government entity. Uh, let's just assume we're talking about, you know, somebody hiring somebody to build a building for them, and they enter into a contract of this sort and for, for a renovation, uh, and... Did, were they were they obligated to to do some due diligence beforehand to ensure that this was not a pre-existing condition when they developed the maximum guaranteed price? And that I have not looked at, and if we, we want to look at that, we certainly can before you you approve it. For me personally, and obviously I don't get a vote on it, but to me, before we pull the trigger on a half a million dollar expenditure, we probably want to do, just a quick double check of the terms and conditions and see if we're actually on the hook for this or not. I mean, or at the very least, go back and discuss it with them and say, look, this is kind of our understanding. I, I'm not trying to leave somebody completely out, hung out to dry on it, but I do feel like we have an obligation to taxpayers to, to double check that first before we just go ahead and sign off on, on that much of a, a change order. Do other council members have thoughts on that? I mean, I'm okay with the double checking, but we knew we were running a risk when we went with a 30 plus year old building and remodeled it. Um, so I, I, I definitely think it's worth double checking just to make sure. And, um, and if it's something that's, but, if it's something that's easily checked, uh, even if we have to call a special meeting just to, if, if it's something that's gonna hold things up, you know, I have no problem with coming in and doing a quick that, meeting just to vote on something if it turns out that, that we, yeah, we, we double checked and contractually we're on the hook for this. Well, and I defer to the idea that <clears throat> we didn't know what was in there. And I can't reasonably, in good conscience, hold Brookstone to knowing what was in there. And we knew that the roof was rickety. In fact, that was on, and I don't know. Do we know a root cause? I'm sorry, I was addressing Bobby, and I'll go to Robert or, or Austin. Do we know why those bolt, bolts and the, the, why we need the reinforcement? Like what rusted, how it rusted, why it did? So when we removed and demolished the pro shop, Two, two beams were rusted through where the pro shop was. So it would be the south side beams um, were rusted through once they were fully exposed. And we started the demolition around April 9th, April 10th, shortly before the opening of the existing building. And then they finished it and the two, two beams were exposed. And so they were like, the bolts were rusted through around the top of the uh, steel. So are we assuming that was just bad bad bolts or do we think it was like rain like water seeped in over time and the, the remediation plan calls for swapping out a lot of bolts because the bolts were used pre-1960 they changed uh since then um i'm not sure as to why that was caused but their 1960 bolts is, is what was stated in the report i guess what what i'm trying to get to is before we before i and I, I understand where Bobby's going, and I, I, I fully agree. Half a million dollars is a lot of money. I mean, so the, no so the, about the contract, uh, the specific to the guaranteed maximum price, accounts for inconsistencies or lack information not presented at the time. All that's required to do the contract, or the, this, in this case, the construction manager, is to con contact the city immediately and go over that and adjust the, the GMP. So that's what we'll be doing here. So you're not you're not in violation or anything of that's contemplated generally in your contract GMP, 
And then, so the second step then would be this, are you in violation of any kind of change orders, which you're not? So, I mean. So we, we, took, we took on the risk of, of, of underlying That's structural so, issues. So the way the contract's not, it doesn't say that you, the city has to account for that. It just says that it's the construction manager, you know, probably know the construction manager and make appropriate adjustments to the, to the GMP. And that's what's happened here. So the, the adjustments are your 500 grand. And so this doesn't say you have to accept that. It just says that's the adjustments to be made, which it looks like they've complied with that. And then again, procurement issues, there's none of those as long as you're within the 25%. But they obviously can't finish the project without doing the work. Then in that case, I, I don't see a reason for much of a delay. Yeah. Okay. Just, just had to ask the question. Just get used to using more of those hot tax funds in the future. <laughs> okay, I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 2024-19. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? Uh, the ordinance passes unanimously. Which brings us to mayor and council comments. I'm going to start down on this end with council member McCray. No comments, okay. Council member Rossi. We have the July 4th parade coming up, or July 4th celebration, excuse me. Um, hope to see you guys out there. Council member Watson. Mm. Uh, I also want to uh, mention that uh, if you didn't know, we're probably expecting upwards of six plus inches of rain over the next three days. So uh, just be prepared. And it's going to be tropical in nature, which means it's going to come in waves. So we have the potential for one of those bursts to be more than two inches in an hour. When that happens, streets flood, other things happen. Hopefully it just stays in the streets. So just be aware, pay attention to local media weather.gov, all the rest, and uh, um, about a week after the July 4th parade, we'll be meeting to discuss the budget. It's an open public meeting. Um, it's a good cure for insomnia, but it also uh, is basically sets the priority for the next year of the city. So uh, that when, it, when we get the information about it available to council, it's available to all citizens. I encourage you to go through it. And if you have any questions, please contact your members of council, and uh, we'll try to get answers for you. Um, that's it. Thanks. Council Member Shepard. I'll just echo uh, Drew's comments on the weather. Just be v vigilant. Uh, <coughs> there's lots of areas in, in the city of Houston that are still recovering from the, the first few storms. So just be um, be mindful and and uh, keep a watch out. I know the power just went out at my house <laughs> tonight, so um, it, it's a precursor for what's to come. I'm afraid. And Mayor Pertem Mitchum. Yes, um, if the last few weeks is an indication of any of the next few months, also I would highly suggest getting some supplies for hurricane season already squirreled away. Um, my, my friends from the north who work with me were quite surprised of the things that we were telling them to get together now. Um, so make sure that you get that all together. And um, I'm ready for Fourth of July fireworks. Did you, did you Councilmember Watson, do you want to tack on to your, your your comments there? I see you forgot I will. Something. I became made aware um, of a great website. We talked about hot tax, and uh, one of the things we want to do is encourage people to come and visit Jersey Village. And as a matter of fact, there is a uh, URL that says visit Jersey Village tx.com, made, made in part by our economic development. So uh, get on to that site and look at uh, some things to do in our fair city. And share it with others so they know yeah, what kind of indeed. what kind of fun stuff there is to to, to do in Jersey Village. Uh, so I, yeah. I I just wanted to, uh, in addition to that, I, I wanted to um, thank all of the city staff um, that and, and all of the citizens who came out and helped 
clear the roads when uh, when the derecho came through, as we've learned it's now called. Um, you know that that was uh, it, it was really great to see people come together and and, um, and make that happen quickly, so that Centerpoint could get in here quickly and start restoring power. Uh, I know we were without power for almost 60 hours at my house. I'm sure a lot of you were were in that same boat thereabouts. Uh, but um, you know, I, I want to thank uh, everyone that helped uh, get us back up and running so quickly. Uh, as they say, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and uh, we made sure to squeak to center point quite a bit uh, over the, those uh, first couple of days to make sure we were, uh, uh, you know, prioritized. So um, thank you again. Uh, so with that, we're going to go ahead and recess the regular session, go into a executive session. Uh, City Council is now going to retire to a closed session at 8.12 p.m. pursuant to the Texas Open Meetings Act, Section 551.087, Deliberation Regarding Economic Development Negotiations, Section 551.072, Deliberations About Real Property, and Section 551.071, Consultations with Attorney, in connection with the following items. One, pursuant to the Texas Open Meeting Act, Section 551.087, Deliberation Regarding Economic Development Negotiations, Section 551.072, Deliberations About Real Property, and Section 551.071, Consultations with attorney, a closed meeting to deliberate information from a business prospect that the city seeks to locate in Jersey Village, TERS No. 2, and economic development negotiations, including the possible purchase, exchange, or value of real property related thereto. Uh, item 2, uh, pursuant to the Texas Open Meetings Act, Section 551.072, deliberations about real property, and Section 551.071, consultations with attorney, a closed meeting to deliberate the potential and possible purchase, exchange, sale, or value of real property located within TERS 3. Item 3, pursuant to the Texas Open Meeting Act, Section 551.072, Deliberations About Real Property, and Section 551.071, Consultations with Attorney, a closed meeting to deliberate information about the possible purchase, exchange, or value of real property related thereto. Pursuant number four, pursuant to the Texas Open Meetings Act, Section 551.071, consultations with attorney, a closed meeting to deliberate Section 552.137 of the Texas Government Code. We will return to open session and continue with the remainder of tonight's agenda after the closed session deliberations are concluded.
Okay, the closed session was adjourned at 9.19 p.m. and no official action or vote was conducted during the closed session. And with that, meeting adjourned.